and, and ultimately, as you know, she did, she, did, she did regret a lot of that. She did feel that she spread herself too thin. That she, I mean, she, she was very, um, she was very self-punishing about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she would have been a lot happier, uh, she believed, if she had devoted herself just to writing fiction. Um, but at any rate, that appetite of hers was something that she didn't want to give up. You know, she wanted to do everything, wanted to read everything, etc. Um, you know, in the end, she felt she really felt that she had made a mistake. I mean, they, you know, that is the thing about about Susan that we we haven't mentioned yet. That that basically, in the end, she judged her life uh, that she had been a failure. Um, now, a lot of very successful people do. I mean, it's not she's not the only one to to, to have that kind of you know. Uh, misunderstanding about herself, really, um, because she did do very, very good work, but she, she really did, did have a sense of herself as having failed in life. Maybe then we always felt from the, I would love to think that from the beginning of her work, the knowledge of, that this was a voice setting itself to, at such a height that of course it would fail. Well, yes, yes. And so there's, there's the pathos of that from the beginning, but we're here to show that, we're here to prove that she didn't fail, Craig. She definitely didn't fail, didn't but fail. Um, I think she, um, she had that constant need for the validation of the world, and of course she wanted the Nobel Prize. And yeah. if she had lived another five or ten years, um, I think it's entirely possible that she, uh, that she might have received it, even though I, have, um, I differ from you, Wayne, about the quality of her fiction. Um, but the, and I certainly don't think that there's anyone in this room who wishes that she had devoted her whole life to her fiction. Um, but, um, but the determination, the sheer will of it, uh, is, so, um, is so moving and so overwhelming that you have to respect it. I think she wanted, I mean, I think part of the problem with her is that she knew that the fiction wasn't landing the way she wanted it to. And mm -hmm. she really wanted to be remembered in 100 years the way Dostoevsky has been remembered. And she wasn't, she didn't have the goods for Dostoevsky. And I, I think there's a certain tragedy. And to go back to your question, I mean, I, our little joke in my office and in the editing room was that we really were completely misguided and that we should be making an opera. You know, and she is, and you, you've written a book about opera, Greg, I, mean, I know nothing about opera really, but you know, she had an operatic life, and of course we have this joke like, all the girlfriends would get these wonderful arias, and then when she dies at the end, they all come together and wail together, it'll be so beautiful. Um, but I, I think that there's, you know, it may be true that the, the work is all over the place, because she wrote, you know, a brilliant essay on Cuban poster art, which we couldn't include in the film, but you know, it's one of my favorite things. And it's not collected. It's not collected. I mean, just as a little aside, this woman was really interested in everything, but but the to me the the, 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 the she was when you were talking about you know dramatic. I mean, we didn't mostly when you make a film, you have to have an antagonist. But Susan Sontag was the protagonist and the antagonist, which was very interesting on a sort of story level. Um, but I also felt that she was tragic, mostly partly because she wanted to be Dostoevsky, but also because I don't think she could have written great fiction, but she refused to write about her passions for women in her fiction. And I, you know, you can tell me I don't know how to write fiction, I'm terrible at it, but it seems to me that if you cut off the thing that you're most passionate about, then you're really screwed. You know, you may not have the skill, but if you also don't put, allow yourself to put the passion in there, then it's hopeless. Well, she wrote The Volcano Lover precisely because she wanted to write about a, a book about love, um, which she also felt she was a failure at. So, um, I don't know. Um, we're going to open it up in a minute for questions. Mo, do you want to have the last word? Oh, I just want to say one thing about uh, her writing her body of work as dramatic speech, or um, what in the, in the archive, uh, there's a piece in the in the journal from that she wrote when she was very young, 14 or 15. And it's like, um, what is it to be young in years and suddenly wakened to the anguish, the urgency of life? It is to stumble out of the jungle and fall into an abyss. And it goes on and on and on about you know her <laughs> her dramatic teenage years, right? And um, in the archive. Uh, that was written on a separate piece of paper, and she had marked it out with the beats as you would a, a Shakespearean text, for instance, you know, where the stress falls in the text. So 
And she loved to read aloud as well. Mm -hmm. So the sound, the musicality of language, I think also there's so it was very, very important to her, I think. I mean, I'm not her, I don't know, but I'm inferring from what she has left us. And um, I, I, I think she heard the words, you know, as she wrote them. Like, how is this going to sound when someone says it aloud? Which is... It's where the stress falls. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, time for questions, folks. Yes. Um, you know, the difference between knowing Susan personally and knowing Susan from her work is very clear in the way you presented her and also in Nancy's film. Um, I thought she was frumpy, you know, with a real sense of how her face and hair looked, but she dressed frumpy. And so to hear everyone talking about her great beauty and stardom is, um, I, would, I wonder how she would feel about that. Um, but the question I had, and, and you may or may not want to even go to it, is I've always wondered about her relationship with her son, particularly after she died, and his role in either protecting or whatever his role was for a long time, uh, which I think gave some of you some trouble. Um, what does that mean, and what does that mean about Susan? I'm not sure, um, I'm not absolutely sure what, I mean, David uh, is, has been editing uh, the journals and, and so on, and he wrote his own memoir, and he, uh, you know, the, he, he was one of the people involved with appointing Benjamin Moser for, to, to write, to be the official biographer, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the, what the question is exactly, what, what the, Exactly? Maybe Nancy could talk to it. <laughs> this is a sneaky question. The obstructionist quality of yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. Um, there seemed to be his, uh, it was hard to get him to give permission for a long I, time. I didn't have anyone's permission to make my film. Um, but this is the great thing about being an independent filmmaker, is that there's no one to get permission. I mean, of course I did ask, um, and... Not only did David not respond, but his agent, the agency for the estate, was very rude to me, which I guess is not uncommon, but um, it was a little bit much. I mean, you know, this film was on HBO. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't in kindergarten. Um, but I did write him one more time. At the very end, I wrote him a two-sentence email saying, this is your last chance. Would you like to say anything for the film? And he wrote me back within 10 minutes and said, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I, di I didn't. No, I yeah, and I I didn't ask or I I just wrote the book. I didn't mm -hmm. you know I didn't ask any permission or get in touch with him or an agent or or anything like that. I mean, there's a possibility for an opera. I mean, again, this is since I didn't know her and I don't know David. This is all. This is imagine in a hundred years, mm -hmm. people asking and thinking the same question. It, it's part of the psychological echo chamber of her work mm -hmm. that she had a child when she was eighteen. Mm -hmm. And the, nineteen. Nineteen. You know, it's part of it's um, part of, and with the, with memoirs, his memoir, your memoir. It's part of the rich emotional atmosphere. He is part of the rich emotional atmosphere of her work. To an outsider. Yeah, I think, yeah. to be fair to him, he doesn't really want to be Susan Sontag's son as a profession, which unfortunately happens when you're, you know, he is a writer and, you know, policy person and has written a lot of books. And, I, you know, it's interesting that in his memoir about her death, he refuses to say anything about his relationship with her except that it was difficult before her death. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a total withholding, that, mm -hmm. you know, which I think was partly why he didn't want to deal with me. But, I, you know... He's very, he did actually give you this blessing, didn't he, Um Well, uh, we had to secure the rights, to, uh, the underlying rights to the journals to use that material um, for an adaptation. And um, so, yes, <laughs> we have that permission. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we uh, you know, uh, okay, so Susan, full disclosure, Susan Sontag was on the board of directors of the Builders Association, which is the theater company that made the show. So uh, we had a personal connection to David already, and you know, took him out for a glass of wine one night and pitched him the idea. And um, he kind of chuckled and said, 
I don't see how that's going to be a piece of theater. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately he did allow us to use the underlying material. So I can say that. Yeah. I want to add one more thing, which is that David asked UCLA not to give me permission to Xerox from the papers. Um, I'm a taxpayer in California. Those are public document, publicly owned documents, so I was very angry about this. Um, I sent one of my colleagues to Xerox. I said, don't tell them that you have anything to do with me. They were allowed to Xerox things. I actually looked into suing UCLA over this because I thought this was a completely outrageous. Um, for someone who is such an advocate of free speech to, to attempt to censor you know, what was, again, a, a fairly credible project in that way was, I thought, was absurd. Um, but there are lots of rights issues, and, and I guess if you were David, you might say that we did violate her copyright. I mean, he hasn't sued us, but, um, and this is maybe too much information, but I, I do think it's, you know, I think I have to talk about this thing with UCLA because um, later on they had a new librarian and I, I, went, I called him and I said, I think you need to apologize to me. And he said, you're right, I do. <laughs> yeah, and he's now gone on to another university, but that was very interesting, and, and, you know, because if you're, you know, doing serious scholarship and you cannot, you know, take home a record of it, you know, it makes it more difficult. Look at Vivian Elliott, but it's, it's, a, it's a literature story. Another question? Yes. Um, oh, by the way, I just, I'm just i still thinking about Frumpy. I don't think she particularly likes to be called Frumpy. But anyway, I, I want to change I don't the, think anybody... Well, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are people, no, there are people which is fine. Trust me. Trust me. But anyway, entirely differently. I, I guess it's worth saying a question, but it would seem to be worth saying a word or two about her political activism. And if I may be quite obvious in my question, what do you think she would think about the controversy over the Penn Award to Charlie Hebdo, in particular. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I, I think it's always a little dangerous um, after someone's yeah, death saying, she would have said this or she would have said that. Nevertheless, it's hard for me to imagine, now I'm going to contradict what I just said, <laughs> that she would have not uh, stood up for this award. Um, she... Um, she uh, championed freedom of speech in every possible uh, in, in, in every possible area, and I don't think well. Uh, it, she didn't always champion the freedom of her own speech, but she right. uh, championed the freedom of others' speech. And I think that um, as the president of she was the president of Penn, and this was exactly the kind of uh, of thing that um, that impassioned her. Uh, her political passions are one of the things I miss most about her. I, I think I would say absolutely. In fact, ever since that uh, controversy started, I thought of her a lot, exactly what you're talking about. And I, I agree. I feel like I, I, I can say that, that I, I'm, I'm quite sure she would have been on the side of the award being given. And also, it has that something to do with her her feelings about the French. And to, uh, that would have, that would have uh, you know, been part of it too. There are two things that uh, she's been on my mind a lot, not just because of this panel, but one is this controversy, but also uh, the Charlie Hebdo, but also the opening of the of the Whitney, of the new Whitney, because David talks about that in his in his memoir that you know certain things will happen, and then you, you get this sort of twinge, like oh Susan's missing this. She wouldn't have wanted she wouldn't have wanted to miss this. This would have been so important to her. That's why it's being open for Susan, and she's not here. Um, she you can have that effect on you. I, I I've thought of her so often in connection with that museum. But yes, Craig, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Can't walk by the film form. Yes, that's true. Her. That's true, and the the, 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 the the lights going up in the in the in the Met in the New York City Ballet. Yeah, you know, that's for the Susan Sontags of the world that yeah. there are such institutions. Yes. Yes. Another question? <laughs> yes. Speaking of France, her love of France and the French, and she went there at a very young age and sort of took up the mantle of. French intellectuals, but she was able, and this goes back to the whole thing about her glamour, to put the twist on it, and she made intellectualism glamorous. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, mm -hmm. 
did anybody carry that on after her? I mean, she kind of like became a paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, and I think, and the, yes, it was the, the 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 French component was very important to her image, and you know but that it was wasn't the language just she spoke. How she looked. No, it no, not at all. It was how she thought, painting. how she felt about thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something she said in practically every interview or something she emphasized in every interview was what a passionate person she was. I think she was afraid because the writing was at a certain level so um, so dry, if I may use mm -hmm. that word non-pejoratively, that people would think of her as, as a person who was not passionate. Uh, and in fact, she did make thinking very sexy. Uh, and I don't think we have a lot of people uh, who are carrying on that tradition. There was Mary McCarthy before her. She was compared she was to not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> the way that Mary McCarthy thought was, was sexy. Um, anyway, I'd like to see someone carrying on. Is it, um, does Sontag say, in her, does Sontag describe in her journals Mary McCarthy's club woman conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Club Woman Gossip. And Club yeah. Woman Gossip. It's in the play, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also her outfits. Mary McCarthy's grin. Gray hair, low fashion, red and blue print suit, Club Woman Gossip. She's nice to her husband. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say one other thing about this. We, there's a lot of stuff that we couldn't put in our film. And, and they actually talk about philosophy on television in France. And there are these mm -hmm. incredibly heady discussions that she had on French television that we decided, like, Americans can't handle this. I mean, I'm sorry. You know, no, no offense. And I, I keep forgetting to mention, my film is being shown tomorrow night at the LGBT Center, which is on Seventh Avenue and Thirteenth Street. There are cocktails at six, and it's going to start at seven. And I'm having a discussion with another filmmaker afterwards. So sorry about the self promotion, but I thought I should tell you. <laughs> she also she came of age intellectually at the at the moment when cinema was the glamour yes, of cinema yes, was being rediscovered yes. as an intellectuals pastime and she had stars images in her room and then she, she her girlfriend was a French movie star and, that's right and she right. you know and, and she also was very involved in trying to she, the part of the reason that we fetishize the French new wave and admire them so much is because Susan Sontag was so relentless in saying these people are doing extraordinary work in this art form and you know again we had such an opportunity as filmmakers to show the work that she was writing about and even you know at the very beginning I was like it's not just a slideshow you know but like we the papers of Farrar, Strauss and Giroux are at the New York Public Library and there are 80 or 100 letters requesting permission for photographs to be used in on photography which was published without any photographs and so I sat there and I was like why the hell didn't she do this and I think it was partially financial that the author had to pay for those photographic rights herself you know, for our Strauss, wasn't going to do that. But, you know, it's kind of sad sometimes that she wrote two books of photography and there are no images in the books. And I think with On Photography, she thought that everyone knew the photographs that she was referring to. But the fact is that that cannot, you know, that wasn't true then. It certainly isn't true now. Um, I also just want to say that uh, as a cinephile, she was such a cinephile, mm -hmm. and she wrote that terribly sad essay in the 90s about the death of cinephilia, and um, I'm particularly sad about her dying when she did, because we all thought in the 90s that this is the end of movies, and then they had that incredible, glorious resurgence early in the century, and I think she would, she would feel great about what's been on the screen uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. But we don't have, I mean, she would go to four or five movies a week, she would see things three or four times. I mean, those people who wrote for Village Voice in the 70s and early 80s, I mean, we don't have the culture of cinema that she was part of and was even sort of fomenting, if that's the right word, you know, particularly in the 60s, but even afterwards. And I mean, maybe, maybe you have it in New York, you have Film Forum, and you have, you know, the Film Society of Lincoln Center, but the rest of us who live in the rest of America, you know, it's not, it's not the same thing at all, unfortunately. How did she squeeze it all? That's the miracle of her life. And what's so moving, we have won like an hour by hour record. How is it physically possible to read that many books and see that many movies? You don't sleep, you take speed. But the speed, the, the speed, taxis. But, this, but, the, but the speed was really about um, when writing. 
you know, not not so much when you know when because and this is something she also was very self lacerating about that she thought she was a terrible model uh, for a writer because instead of doing it every day, which is how she believed you should, the most productive writers work. Uh, she couldn't get, she would take all these distractions. She would go see a movie she'd already seen three times. So she would go and have dinner with somebody and so on. And then at a certain point, there'd be the deadline, and that's when she would take a lot of speed and stay up around the clock. Because, um, right, I mean, I, I mean, I remember that very distinctly the first time that that happened, where, like, I, I would go to sleep, she'd be typing in the next room and wake up in the morning, and she was still typing in the next room. And I, and, I mean, she really didn't need to take a break. I mean, she would just go on and on until she, until she was finished. Exemplary. <laughs> we have, um, we have three minutes. Oh. So, um, just one make more question. one more question, or just yes. I just want to share. A, I think it's a quote. I hope I'm not paraphrasing. Um, but I think it speaks to her passion for outsiders. Um, and it goes like, I like map people, people who stand alone and burn. I like them because they give me license to do the same. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a madness in her for <sighs> burning and standing alone no matter what people say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Judge. Yeah. She loved, you know, Artaud and Genet, and she lionized these men and spent a lot of time working on them. And, you know, they were definitely the epitome of what you're talking about. She did see herself as an outsider. I mean, I don't see her as an outsider. I, I never, I never have. But she did like to see herself that way, and that was, she, she spoke of herself as a defrocked intellectual. I mean, that's why she didn't want to have a, a tenure or any kind of safe job or anything like that, but, but uh, I mean, she was so much an insider, I mean, you can't, you can't have it both ways, I mean, you can't be like the biggest insider and an outsider, um, but she did feel that way, she did. The, the inner burning, the ardor, yeah, the I think ardor. of her as an Arto. Yes. secret Arto. Yes. but to, to read all her work for the inner burning, it, I mean, it's a gratifying experience. Um, so maybe we should just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. What was the phrase, Philip? The burning? To stand there and burn? To stand I like up. mad people. I like them. Uh, I like mad, mad people. People who stand alone and burn. People who stand alone and burn. Thank you, Susan Sontag. Thank you all. And there are books for sale out Thank in the you, lobby. Thank you.